Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, there's not much left to say after Harry's presentation, so I think I'll make it quite brief. Um, I think the first point I want to make, although I'm honored to work for Praza, this is not a presentation by Praza or am I delegated by the board to say the things I'm going to say. And I'd rather be my old, what was referred to in my farewell speech, where somebody said about me that I'm irreverent. And that's what I'll try and do today to at least spark some thinking uh, and discussion among you. I hope that you don't like a lot of the things I say because in that case it means that at least you'll form partnerships with people in your own group that will agree on certain things. And on the other hand, I'd like you to actually be prompted to think uh, slightly differently. <clears throat> okay, um, the first thing is I'd like to do from an introductory point is, I should go back and say this is my topic was public transport, urban access, lessons and issues. I'm not gonna be as uh, erudite as uh, Harry was, so I'll keep it quite simple. We're talking about accessibility. Accessibility, quite simply, is a statement of how many destinations can you get to in a certain amount of time and at a certain cost. That's affordable. Thank you, Harry, for introducing the affordability thing. The next part is I'd like to break it down to passengers and country because I believe that the two pieces fit together and we forget them, we forget to think about them separately and we'll come back to the term affordability in a minute, which was, once again, it was not rehearsed but it was quite useful for me. In terms of the country, and I'll start with them, because in the end, whatever we do has to be affordable to the country. So what are the costs of providing more and more accessibility? One is we actually uh, tell people they can travel further, which costs more to do. We tell people they must have a higher quality, which you can't afford, which will cost more. That means we'll have to have a bigger subsidy because they probably can't afford to pay as much as we would like them to. And of course, one of the costs of traveling further is greenhouse gas emissions. As far as the passenger is concerned, their costs are the fares they pay, and I'm talking only about public transport, the travel time and the transfers they take, and I'll touch on those things in, in the rest of my presentation. Of course, there are benefits. The benefits should be measured by a government when they fund a project in terms of economic, social, environmental, and political exercises. You know, there is a cost-benefit analysis, Marissa, I'm sorry, it is one but it's got to be measured on these terms. It can't be just whimsically we'll buy a product, as Harry would say, to cut a ribbon. <laughs> on the passenger side, the benefits to a passenger with increasing accessibility, obviously they have more destinations to get to in the amount of time and budget that they would have, which gives them more opportunities to do things and probably, if it's a work trip, to choose a better job which pays a bit more. The question that we don't do is we don't take the cost and benefits of these, both these groups, and ask ourselves the question is, how much accessibility do we have? Is it sufficient? And if it's not, then we go back and get, give more. But we never ask that question because as a transportation planner, my success would be in giving people more accessibility. The more I give them, in fact, the more I spend, the more popular I am. And the question I'm asking you is to think about, can you ask the question about how much accessibility is enough Okay, and that is actually my hidden agenda, which is not on the program to bring through today. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is essentially affordability, and I'll just do that briefly in talking about trip length distribution. I'll talk about the cost of public transport and show some little things in there that might be of interest. Of course, to get people onto a bus, you need them to live somewhere, so you need certain densities to make certain modes more affordable, uh, more appropriate. And then I'll talk about three little things which I think might be quite interesting. One is the distance, cost, fares, and social equity. The next thing is the, the penalty for feeders, and this is not in a diet program. It's actually about the, taking people onto the, the bigger vehicles. And it parallels my number six, which deals with the impact of BRT on the taxi industry. I'm sure you all would like to know about that. And then I come out with my hidden agenda, which is about restructuring the city. So this is a trip length distribution for Cape Town from a set of data that we've used. What's interesting for me is one, that the average for low, p uh, low income people is 13.5 kilometers and for high it's 11.8. Surprise, surprise. The other thing that's probably more interesting is that the poor people, 21% travel more than 20 kilometers, while of the rich only 15 travel more than uh, 20 kilometers. And I ask the question, how is this affordable to the poor? And then I, just to, para, to mix that with public transport versus private transport, I've given you some numbers there. 
What's more important for me is to quote figures that I was being given for Shanghai, which used to be about four kilometers of the average trip to work, and it's sort of growing to eight, and they're very upset about it. And Seoul in about the 1980s or so had an eight kilometer trip, and somebody told me yesterday that Ho Chi Minh City is something like four or five kilometers. Now, if you think about competing with these people and transport costs is one of the things, we're not hiding to nothing. So giving more and more accessibility means people are gonna travel more and more, therefore it's gonna cost us more to produce our widgets. Okay, so the usual solutions in the Western world or the uh, developed world when worrying about the impact of travel, which is um, greenhouse gas linked, is to find more, more efficient engines. So we do that and now we can all drive Hummers because we can do much better. The second thing is to try and reduce the amount of motorized transport. And so that's where we try and push people into public transport. But in Africa and in most of our cities, a lot of people already take public transport. So we can't actually get much savings by doing that. And what instead what we're gonna do is throw money like anything to try and get a couple of guys out of their cars into our public transport. The question is, why are we doing it? And so the last one, it comes to the notion of trying to reduce travel distance by any means that we can, which of course is an anathema both to my profession and to politicians and to most people that probably are sitting in this room. And if the one solution that is easy to talk about is a thing called ex excess travel. It's well known in the thing. It is this sh shown in this diagram where basically what you try and do is you try and tell people that are sort of traveling to jobs that are not as close to them as they could do to swap and travel to the closer ones. So you can see those drawing the top one, people are traveling quite far in the bottom one, they're traveling quite little. And various literature gives you all sorts of estimates of how much we could save. In a study done by Tabane uh, in 2005, he showed that the poor had a 6% amount of spare or excess capacity uh, travel, and the non-poor had 16%. Now 16% is really very little to play with, and 6% doesn't exist. So for our poor people in Cape Town, we don't have much space to save their traveling which of course you would expect if you don't have much money, you're gonna get the closest job. Okay, once again, my hidden agenda comes through. I don't know how it keeps coming up all the time. Okay, okay. that lets me jump onto the next topic, which is the issue about the cost of travel. Now these are diagrams that you'd expect. Uh, I quite don't have a good pointer here. Okay, so that's the graph for the minibus. And that's the graph for a bus and that's a graph for a BRT, and that's a graph for the train, which you can see is really cheap, that's why I work there. Okay. The issue is, is a few things I wanna point out about what this graph tells me. First of all, there are economies of scale. So it's no good trying to put a mode in an environment where the economies of scale don't suit it. The second thing that to notice is that they cross each other, which means that there are environments where they are cheaper than the other person. And the last point that I want to point, bring your attention to is the word at the top, which is called total. Because most projects don't like the word total because you can't make them pay, obviously, because your capital costs, especially on heavy stuff like rail and BRTs, are a big slice. And strange and strange may seem, you do actually have to pay for it. Either it gets paid by somebody else, or it gets paid in 25 years' time or 30 years' time when you have to fix it. So in the analysis, in deciding things, one needs to bring in the total picture. But if I was a city and the DOT was throwing money at me, I would take it because it doesn't actually matter. All I do is worry about the operating costs. But my decisions are therefore skewed. And as a country, I don't think we can afford them. So that's a thing to remember. And of course, there are greenhouse gas costs as well that you might like to take into account. So that's really what I wanted to say about the notion of worrying about the costs of providing a mode. Of course, if you wanna make something work, you have gotta get passengers. And so what I've designed here, so designed, I apologize to Harry for that statement, is two options. The first one is the typical corridor that we have with stops along it. And you can decide how wide you want that to be. So if you want to tell the people you're being kind to them, you're going to say to them it's only 500 meters. If you want to afford it, you're going to have to go to a kilometer wide. At the bottom one, it's actually a similar system, but instead of actually having just a one service along it, you've got a feeder system into the, into the stations or stops along there, and so you can widen that corridor, okay? And then what I've done is I've taken that and created a little model here which says, given the fixed parameters at the top, like peak uh, pass, uh, public transport trips uh, as, a, as a ratio, a directional split, uh, max, minimum frequency in the peak hour, da-da-da-da-da, I try and work out the amount, the density I need 
to marry the passengers per day that that vehicle has to carry in terms of those economies of scale diagrams I showed you earlier. Okay. So you can see the kind of numbers we've got. I've done them in, in red so that they can stand out a bit. And the two trains there, one is a six coach train and the other one is a 12 coach train, which is what we're getting in the future. And I thought I'd sort of bring that up as well. And I pulled that all together. And in that diagram, you've got mini bus operating, bus operating, trains operating, and, bigger, uh, uh, and another set of trains operating. And the peak and off peak deal with setting a standard that you'd like. And remember, I talked about quality. Setting standards is actually an issue about quality. So I would say the minimum service you could have in the peak hour should probably be four vehicles. In the off peak, one. And the next one is the economies of scale, the EOS. All I'm trying to do with this term, with this graph, is to say, look, there are ways of calculating and thinking about how dense your place must be to sustain specific modes that are operating. And that can now move on to my next topic. So now we come to the city nitty gritty uh, of the city's decision making that they're faced with. I've borrowed here the monthly fares for the rail system that we have. So it's got Metro, which is in effect a more uh, dense bunch of people in a train compared to Met Metro Plus, which is less dense uh, bunch of people in a train, and the My City fares for Cape Town. Uh, in all honesty, I've used the My City not to show that they are, but I didn't have enough time to fix it when I done it. It actually had single fare as opposed to a monthly, or where there's a discount. And so what it shows is two, a few things for me. First of all, that if the monthly income is only 2,500 Rand, and there are a lot of people in Ca South Africa and Cape Town that only earn that amount if they're lucky, then that dotted line says how much they can afford at 10%. Now, what does that mean, if that's the case? Is that they can afford to travel a whole lot of kilometers on the Metro Plus, uh, sorry, on the Metro, they can afford to travel 19 kilometers on the uh, Metro Plus, and they can't afford to travel on the My City. Okay. Actually, they might not be able to travel that distance on a, on a train either because they've got to get there. And if they've got to pay another 200 Rand for the minibus fares per month, then you can add that onto that, and you can see that they might not be able to afford that either. Of course, if you're catering for people that are earning 6,000 Rand a month and they can catch a bus, then the My City is fantastic. But affordability is one of those things that needs to be considered. And I now want to play with the fares exercise again in a different guise. I hope you can see the thin lines there. The bottom thin line is slightly in blue. That's the fare structure. The, the dotted line is the same dotted line you saw before. But the next line, which is in red, is actually the operating costs minus a few things. Uh, now, that's real data. The next line is what I've had to put in because basically it doesn't cover some of the overheads and it doesn't take into account the people that don't pay for fares. And I've been quite, I think, conservative in only adding 20% to get that line. So that's what it says. It's saying to me that that is the line of what it costs us to carry people and the blue line is what they are paying. Now, I've got to ask you, why are, so no, so my income equity from a form of uh, income can, is affordable. It is affordable if they catch the train. So we've covered that. So we're doing our social duty, which is correct. That's something that we should be doing as public transport. The second thing I'm asking you to do to say is, um, but we are paying quite a bit of subsidy on that. The next one is, why are we doing it? And one of the reasons we should be doing this is because of the apartheid city. The question I have to ask you, most of you that are physical in terms of your spatial, spatial in your thinking, is should we, does the apartheid city, as a mistake, allow us to tell people in Mabupane, don't worry about it because you live so far, we'll, we'll subsidize you all the way to Johannesburg. Is that part of the penalty of the apartheid city? Or is part of the penalty of the apartheid city will take them from Mabupane to, to Pretoria? I'll leave that in the air because that is a political decision. Because if you look at that graph when we apply those values, that's what we're doing there, let's say, with the 80-kilometer trip. Okay. That is a political decision. What apartheid city remnants do we have to subsidize as part of, of the social equity program? The other thing I want to do is to highlight that line because that area shows all the subsidy you have to pay. And you can choose to either support somebody that's going to travel 80 k's or support about four or five people that are going to travel to 30 k's. That would be another decision that you can make. 
Once again, if you support the ones that are traveling 80 Ks, you're actually encouraging long distance travel and you're also encouraging more greenhouse gas things and you're encouraging spending more money which you actually do not have. But that'll be enough for that piece. Right, the next one is a sort of buzzy and catchy phrase. It deals with the, penal uh, the penalties of feeders. Um, one of the fundamental things about a BRT or a train service is you actually have to get people to be aggregated together. They must be brought to you to make that line work. Okay. Which means that you have to create feeders. Okay. Now, I will quote from this one because I love this quote. It comes from a Viva document of 2007. Bill Cameron will know it pretty well. The use of high quality, dedicated infrastructure and a planning process to optimize operations allow, have allowed cities to significantly reduce subsidies. The operational plan for phase one of Johannesburg's Zoyavaya project projects a 34% net profit in system. That'll sell anything to me, 34% profit, I love it. The next thing that happens in contrast, and this I don't believe is probably as true as it might look on paper, Etequini, sorry Tommy, <laughs> uh, is projecting to increase subsidies from 280 million rand to 1,1 billion rand per year, a fourfold increase. Sis. Okay, so the question is, this is a seller for your BRT, but in any, that's also a seller for any other exercise. The one thing I want to bring it out is what are the penalties in actually operating feeders? Because it's all very well to say it's a good idea. And so on the left-hand side, you can see what you do when you go direct. Taxis do this for you. They pick you up in one side and they take you to the other end. If of course you're going to feed, what actually happens is you're going to be collected up, if I can get this thing to work. Here we go. Picks you up over there, takes you over there, makes you get off over here, then you get on another vehicle for which you have to wait because it's unlikely to be there waiting for you. And then you go to the other side and you've got to get off, ouch dear. You then have to get off there and similarly. And that creates penalties in various ways. So we ran that number for a whole lot of exercises. I'm not going to take you through all the details. But what this summarizes is comparing feeder trunk distributor on the left hand side with direct service on the right hand side we found that on energy, the feeder trunk distributor beats the direct service. You can see by the green things. And on the, but on everything else, it doesn't do so well for obvious reasons. And one would think, now I'm talking about costs, not fares, okay, cost. Uh, just to tell you what's in those, uh, the, the table, there are average values for the data that we got out versus the highest and lowest possible in comparing the two options. And then the high and low, the low is what we would have used was the base model, and then the high, because we wrote this paper to be presented in the States, had what would be the impact of higher labor costs? Because everybody says you have to have this joining of uh, aggregation of, of stuff because of the high labor costs. And then the last one there, the low and no, is actually that you have low, South Africa's uh, labor costing system, but you don't have a distribution leg. Because often you get to a CBD and you can walk to it. And you can see that's when you do reasonably well also with a, 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 a feeder, trunk and distributor. Okay, so in other words, there are penalties and the penalties are in terms of costs, average time, but on the energy side, it was, does better. So then we actually went and said, where will these things work? So what we found is that feeder, trunk and distributor always, always more costly for di uh, direct services for the low and high, but in 25% of the cases, it was less costly. In terms of time, it was always a longer time with uh, direct services. And in, seven, and in fact, except for 7% of the cases that we tried, it was more, tha it was more than 1.5 times the travel time of direct services. Why? Because you had to wait and get on and get off. With respect to energy, it was less than direct services, and that's good. The question you might ask me is, why is everybody pumping for uh, a, a BRT kind of aggregated services? The answer is actually obvious. Is if you're going to try to get a lot of people on a busy corridor into a small space, you need a bigger vehicle. Okay. The question I have to ask ourselves is, are the corridors that we're developing in South Africa busy enough to warrant the forced aggregation? Okay. Uh, another thing that came up at SHC, which is quite interesting, is I think we want a monopoly on the people that use our corridors because we built them with our money. Actually, it wasn't our money, but is our money. Isn't it? And we don't want anybody else to use it. And I think it was Manila that gave a presentation where they said, actually, they're letting the people other, until the time that they get so busy with their own vehicles, they're going to let other uh, vehicles use those 
those that, that way, uh, we can look at that space. Okay, can I move on to the next topic? Yes. This one actually piqued our interest, uh, and uh, there we've got the same kind of logo at the bottom as uh, Harry's got, because we call the African Center uh, for Excellence for Studies of Public and Non-Motorized Transport. It's based in Cape Town. It's a group of um, Dar es Salaam and Nairobi University in UCT. And so we gave a paper at a conference in, in, in Addis, and this is what we talked about, is the impact of BRT on the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. And this is based on Cape Town, so you might not like it. That is actually a diagrammatic of a direct service service. Every zone goes to everybody else. That is what would happen when we take the trunk out of it and give it to somebody else. So the top one is what taxis were doing, and the bottom one is what a BRT solution would actually look like. And so you are going to be taking out all that piece, and we wanted to know how much that is. Yes, there are lots of ways of... Uh, getting involved in the taxi industry, but this is one event that would actually happen. <coughs> oh, yeah, let's move on. So we did another one of our silly tables, and you can find it on the left-hand column. It's the distribution of taxi trips by distance, then the number of passengers that were doing that. This is for Cape Town. And then we had three options, a direct service, which is the status quo, versus a uh, only doing the feeder service, one piece of it, we said it could be as much as five kilometers, and then the second one, doing a feeder and a distributor service, which could be as much as 10 kilometers. So obviously, those kind of options wouldn't affect the first and second line, and so we got these kind of answers. So in the first line, you would see that the minibus taxi industry is making a profit. In the second line, you can see it's losing 11 b uh, million rand a year. That's for Cape Town. If you do add that all together, uh, they are losing 112 million rand. They don't quite know this because they're not spending all the money and they're not buying new vehicles because this is a total cost model. Uh, but they, you, they look like they do feel it because they're not fixing their cars as well as they uh, could <laughs> and they're driving quite fast to get there. So they're not doof, you know, so they do know what's going on. Now let's pull all this together because this is quite interesting. So if we said, we're going to emasculate you and only let you do the feeder or the feeder and distributor services. This is how your operating cost, which is your turnover, would look like. It'll change from uh, uh, 1,6 billion down to 1 billion if you only do the first five <coughs> kilometers and 1,3 um, 1, if you do a feeder and a distributor. Your annual fare would change from 15, 1,5 billion to 1,3 or 1,4. But you'll notice that in effect what's going to happen is you, you might reduce the operating cost by 38%, but you only reduce the fee, fee, the income by 17%. So in effect, you'd be doing the favor. Because if you look at the bottom line, whereas at the moment they're losing 112 million, uh, million rand a year, they would be making 255 million rand in the, in the first option and 76 in the second. So by one stroke of a pen, we could actually make the, to the, the taxi industry viable. I think we should get an applause for that, except for the next page. <laughs> <laughs> the next page says that this is how much less they're going to carry, and those are passenger kilometers. That is very interesting. I mean, basically, you're going to carry 56% less passenger kilometers. But the next line is actually the crunch line, as far as I'm concerned. We... In terms of the modeling that I did, we, need, you used, we needed to use 6,164. And the Cape Town guys are going to tell me about the 7,600 minibuses in Cape Town. And I'm going to say, sure they are, but they don't use them all. The next thing I'm going to say is, as a result of this policy, you'd only need 3,540 of them. That actually means you need 2,600 less minibuses. And if you let them actually do the distributor as well as the collector, you'd, you'd need 1,000 less uh, minibuses. And that actually is probably what they are moaning about without knowing the numbers. They've got a feeling that they're going to run out of some work. Okay? And so maybe that's why the minibus in industry is so apprehensive about cities uh, and implementing BRTs. I think they would like to know these numbers, and if, you, if the cities actually discuss these numbers with them, you could actually come to a, uh, a, I don't know, there's a nice French word about getting together or something. Okay, how am I doing? Have I got five minutes? Thank you. <clears throat> This is my hidden agenda, and I thought I'd like to uh, bounce it off you. You might find it bizarre, and I hope you do, because then it means you'll think about it. 
What I'm trying to do is to reduce the amount of travel that is necessary. The first answer to that is transit-oriented development. Everybody will tell you what a good idea it is. It is a brilliant idea. It has one downfall, because it does provide the opportunities for reducing travel, but it doesn't force you to reduce your travel. Okay? And I don't think we've got the guts to charge you enough to force you to. I mean, even the toll roads in Joburg aren't going to force anybody off the roads. So the one thing I'm trying to do is to say, what if I restrict motorised accessibility? It takes a lot of political war, but maybe we've got powers coming through that'll do that. But in parallel to that, when, he, when I decide to reduce the amount of accessibility that people have, I would at the same time like to have some sort of number in my head about how much is sufficient accessibility. Now, I must point out that I can't please everybody. Because if I happen, like I do now, as I live in Cape Town and I work in London, I mean, you can't not give me that accessibility. I need that. Okay. But for most of the people in town, we should be able to say, we've given you X number of jobs to choose from within this radius, and we think that that's enough. We think it is enough, and let's see if we can find a proof for it. So, my next jump was to just arbitrarily draw a drawing. So I'm now going to become an urban designer, remember what I learned in town planning school, and I'm going to propose the following. A system of subsidies, pun on the word subsidy, notice, okay, that are not highly connected. In fact, I would like to discourage people to travel out of them, and they will have fantastically good internal connections, and I'll show you why that's easy possible in a minute. And to a large extent, I'd like them to be largely self-contained. By the way, this flies in the face of everything that's been published in the planet. The question is, is such a thing feasible? It is not feasible in London, they're not going fast enough. But it might be feasible in an African city, because we're going to double in the next 25 years. I'm sure that Joburg's going to double, sorry, Gauteng's going to double in population in the next 25 years. I'm sure that maybe Etiquini is going to double in the next 25 years. I might even go so far as to say Cape Town might double in the next 25 years, but I don't know what, I think there's people from uh, East London here? Okay, I don't know how your town's going to do. But for the other ones that I've mentioned, if you're going to double, we're going to have to provide as much living space and as much job space as we've got at the moment. And that's only in a short period, probably even within my lifetime, I don't know. That, so in other words, it is actually a feasible thing if you have got a long-term plan, what Harry was talking about just now, to say this is what we want to do, and the reason we want to do it is so that it's not necessary to travel so far because we actually cannot afford it. Unless you guys think that we're all going to have a 10% GDP growth rate per annum for the next 25 years. If you don't, you're not going to be able to do it. The city, once again, this wasn't composed, I just drew a circle, I worked out some numbers, and it came out to be fortunate for me because it actually just said, uh, 216,000 workers and about 450,000 uh, uh, residents. And in my head, I had something of the size of 500,000. I haven't proved it yet. If I get some funding, I will. <laughs> and what I've done here is I've taken the 2007 peak period commuter trip generation in Cape Town, and I just said, hey, what if I do that? And I drew two, two circles. First of all, this one, which says how many attractions are there to 2000. Uh, 200,000 to, to an area, which is five kilometers in radius. And strangely enough, it came up to 200,000. And those are jobs, because that's what people are coming in, at that, in that period. And strangely enough, on the other side of town, there was a bunch that had 190,000 workers that were leaving that area to go to work. So all I have to do is put more red into the green stuff and put more green stuff into the red stuff. And that's all I'm saying to do, because within that stuff, I could to a large extent, create 500,000 people living there, 200,000 jobs, which would accommodate most of them. Okay. However, so on a scale business, it's okay. So what are the advantages of my self-contained, sorry, my self-contained, that was a Freudian ship, wasn't it? <laughs> <coughs> Contained subsidy. First of all, obviously there'd be shorter commuting patterns. You don't have to travel further than five or 10 kilometers. And on a five and 10, uh, public transport trip, which requires almost no or almost no subsidy. Walking and cycling will become possible. Savings in transport sub uh, uh, subsidy. If we actually take that, we're saving from 13 kilometers average to five kilometer average, we're going to save eight kilometers, it's 44 days a month, 12 months a year, times a rand a kilometer in the excess cost. We're saving about 424 rand per year per commuter. That's not something to sneeze in if you sneeze at if you add all the commuters oh. together. The other thing that can be seen as a positive is that because you have these different uh, sub-cities, you're not going to have 
a primate center. And the thing about a primate center is because it is so primate, and that's not got nothing to do with chimpanzees, this is because it's so big, it actually pushes up the land costs and value at the center. By doing this, you'd actually dilute that amount of accessibility, therefore the land cost would be lower, and it might be more affordable to be living in those spaces. What I've tried there is this little sum. I don't know where I got these numbers from, but I think it was for Cape Town. If you take 1.2 billion rand subsidy that we're getting for something and a 0.4 billion for the BRT rollout per year, and we use that to entice developers to locate jobs according to a local authority plan of their real future, and if we can ask, what can 1.6 billion rand buy? If we only provided the land and it makes up 20% of the total cost of a development, which is quite rule of thumb, quite a number, we could then, and we assume it's 10,000 rand per square meter to build, we could produce 640,000 square meters of built space. And if we think that every worker takes up 30 square meters of that space, we could house, we've built accommodation for 21,000 jobs where we would want to put those. So, for the, so you know, instead of just building BRTs and rail and all the other stuff, one could consider p putting money on the other side to attract the land use you want. Of course, there are disadvantages. I forgot to tell you about those. The first one is obviously that it's a primate center and there is a problem with that because a lot of your marketing and your selling of your city has got some primacy. But I would suggest that even if you were to impose the plan that I've showed you just now in Cape Town, the center of Cape Town would still be the historic hub, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing, of course, you would be doing is you say to people, you can no longer believe, even though you can't afford it, to think that the whole of Cape Town is an area within which you can look for a job. Because I think the Gauteng, Train, which is my pet project, is actually telling you that you can live anywhere in Gauteng and find a job anywhere else in Gauteng. That's what it's doing. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves the question about, first of all, how do we curse the private sector into locating? And yes, we can play around. Give them, 20, give them the land, tell them you're going to buy, rent some of the space because the authorities need spaces at these sub-centers and make a decision about development in two weeks as opposed to two years and they'll buy a bit into that. We need to understand the amount of aggregation of businesses that are required to make it work. And the other one is we need to understand the consequences of, of reduced accessibility. Now, I'm one of these guys that can't choose anything in a menu because it's just too complicated for me. And so my wife chooses it for me, and I'm always happy. But there is theories out there that actually say that you can have too much choice. So you can have also too much accessibility. Okay. And that's what we try to do. So we did a survey, and we asked 47 uh, employers to tell us about how they would value the total cost or what utility they would get from the, from the total package. And we gave them an arbitrary situation for their low-income workers, and you can see what's important for me there is that there's a disjoint in those two curves. The other thing that's interesting for me is it goes downhill. So as an employer, employing people from further away, when he fa starts facing the costs of doing so, he would make a judgment call about doing it. The thing is not so clear from the employer's side when you're employing higher-income people, probably because he doesn't feel that cost. The important thing for me here is the following. It, first of all, bigger catchments do not always bring uh, more benefits. In fact, they don't bring benefits at increasing rate like you would have thought they always do. And secondly, therefore, what level of accessibility does not add benefit is something that we can start studying. We're also now doing a survey of employees to see if they perceive it in the same way. So if I can conclude. I started with accessibility and asked this, the question, how much accessibility can we afford to, that people have in our cities? It is a real, real question. PT extends distance and therefore adds accessibility, but you're going to have to ask, at what cost? <clears throat> I dealt with distances, costs, and fares. I looked at the issue of social equity in terms of the income of people and ability to pay for fares. I've dealt with the apartheid city, which is really something that's in our face, but we need to apply the rules for the apartheid city in the space and distance where it applies, not everywhere. We need to ask the question, does adding accessibility actually benefit the country, in which case we must provide more accessibility? And are we often subsidizing the rich by really buying very fancy stuff that only they will use? Okay. And then I added three issues. Thank you. <laughs>